ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Clash Cast, episode number two. Today we are discussing Microsoft and Apple earnings reports. So, Marson, I'm going to let you start since Microsoft went first on Monday, I believe. Is that correct, Marson, Monday? It, uh, yes, it is correct. It was uh... Microsoft Monday, Marson. I think we got a thing going here. So, uh, I'm going to let you take the reins and we'll talk about Microsoft's earnings first. Before I talk about the earnings, I just say I just want to say it's unfortunate that Apple does not have a day of the week to alliterate with. So, I f- um, you know, my condolences. That'd be really cool if it was Marson, Microsoft, and my name was like Adam and Apple. I don't know. Anyways, Marson, okay, take it away. Okay, let's do it. Let's do this. Um, so... It's a period of transition at the company. I don't think anyone was... Ex- well, of course, the analysts always project every quarter, and what they were projecting was a slight profit decline from the year ago period because of XP upgrades. So the uh, XP cycle, you could say, ended the year before, so all that revenue which boosted them and added to their profit margins was obviously going to be missing. And we have several other businesses, mostly Windows, that's in transition. Obviously, they're trying to figure out how to monetize that. But it was a strong quarter. We are still talking about, and this does seem rather paltry compared to the Apple numbers we'll discuss, but $26.47 billion in revenue, which was actually a beat. Uh, 71 EPS, which was exact. I, I've never seen, like, like I rarely see, like, they get, like, this, the EPS cr- completely right. That They guess 71 consensus, consensus and the EPS was 71 cents, so uh, nothing too surprising, still big numbers, and growth in a lot of sectors. We'll start with Surface, which is, I think, the most impressive story, because everyone was writing this off uh, two years ago, this entire division, saying, like, why are they spending so much money on this? We see $1.1 billion in revenue. Uh, They have this weird practice in that they don't they report unit numbers for some units, they report revenue numbers for others, but at least we're getting the the idea that's up from 900 million the previous quarter, so definite growth around, I think, 30% or so. Uh, an interesting stat is that that's selling, the th- Pro 3 is selling f- three times faster than the Pro 2 ever did, so obviously it's looking like a success. Uh, I, I mentioned in an article, it appears that's becoming kind of like one of those uh, not not like uh, the highest high-end kit, like your super processor things, but kind of like that nice-looking, l- slightly luxurious experience, kind of like what Apple is known for. It's becoming like one of those brands that sits alongside in that uh, in that uh, level. So uh, they also mentioned, which is very important, the service dis- division instead of last quarter when they said it had just reached profitability. So I guess it made like two or three dollars in profit, they say it's now substantially more profitable. So it looks like that's on a good direction. Did you want to bring up anything with this? Sure. I mean, it's interesting. You know, we do mention that we we used to write off the surface and joke about it. And I think it was their first, at least recently, their first big um, entrance into the hardware business um, for, you know, consumer, tablet, whatever you want to call it. Um, what do you see is the the future of the Surface, and how can they build upon the Surface Pro 3? So I think we saw a few hints. You can always kind of guess where the big kind of you know PCs are going because of all the hardware that's released, like Intel processors and the monitors. I think uh, Dell XPS 13, you know, the generic name, but Dell's not a private company, so apparently they do good stuff instead of the junk that they used to. I guess, I guess they still sell junk, but they they have some high quality stuff on the higher end. Uh, they have something called the Infinity Display, which shows that it's much easier to get rid of the bezels on the side. So even keeping the same size, and I think we've seen this rumored with the MacBook uh, coming soon, they're gonna be able to increase the screen size, but not even increase the actual size of the device, or very slightly, which would be a, a boon for a lot of people who maybe still felt that the screen was a little too small. I definitely see a Pro 4. I think they are killing the RT line because the two, you know, in the 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 one that's based on the ARM, ARM chips that doesn't run full Windows, kind of like the iPads and Android things, just didn't take off. They kind of figured out that the Pro th- Pro line is the part to focus on, and it doesn't look like they're selling any more twos. So I'm just expecting a Pro 4, really. Maybe two size options just to give a little bit of choice. A Surface laptop, not really, but with the Surface Hub, maybe we're going to see like a cherry-picked, very 
limited line, a little in the Apple route, but not as many device choices. I think that that could be something we see at the end of this year. Definitely a Pro 4, though, for the summer. Lumia sold 10.5 million units. Uh, that's a record. It's not impressive, again, next to maybe the Samsung and Apple numbers, but you have to remember this is what was ostensibly a software company just a few years ago, and they're selling, well, already the things that I've mentioned we're talking about almost in the 15 million range in the amount of hardware units they've sold. On top of that, you can add the 30 million non-Lumia, so all of those budget handsets that the emerging markets get. I think that that's interesting because they've hit a new high, new record, but what you see is that the phone revenue fell from 2.6 to 2.3 billion. So that shows that the low-end devices are driving growth, which is part of the story. And I think I've talked about how it's difficult for high-end devices to drive growth, even because we haven't seen any new flagships for people to, you know, fawn over or buy. So probably these are sales that are growing in markets besides the U.S. and the West, which is, growth is always good. But I'm I'm hoping that they can do more, like I mentioned before. I mean, it's interesting because if we t- we talked about it in our last Clash Cast that you said um, that there wasn't a big flagship out there, um, especially in the new recent events. So it'll be interesting to see how they drive growth without having at least you know a recently coming um, flagship device. Uh, but it seems like you know it, it's picking up. It's, those are not numbers to sneeze at, um, and it's definitely difficult with all of the competition out there. Right. I think that puts in like the top five or six at least. I don't think many companies sell in that double digit million anymore. It's very like tough to get into that range. Right. And I think Google recently sold off Motorola because that was a uh, not a very good buy, but you know. And they seem to be uh, moving straight along with that. So Xbox had a blockbuster quarter. We're talking 6.6 6 million devices, which is a lot for video game consoles. Uh, that is not a surprise because we saw the NPDs that track US sales that they sell faster than the PlayStation in November and December. This is very impressive, but we can't forget that so because of all of the promotions, revenue fell 20%. So this is sort of a theme with some of the hardware here where we see less revenue but more unit sales. Obviously, sales are good. What's the thinking? Uh, get to that soon. Uh, cloud just chugging along really office 365 for consumers so the stuff that you and i would buy 2.2 million new subscribers that means that you know we're talking about 9.2 million and that's 1.1 billion dollars every quarter that can just rely on basically that's you know that's just banked money Um, right i don't think anyone's going to compete with them on that front you know it's it's their enterprise and you know it's it's become ubiquitous that's the flow over into like the consumer market like that's just people who rely on office anyway and they trust it and it's pretty much it's a very reliable brand even if it has its problems there's nothing really that kind of has that complete solution that it's it's still pretty polished even though some people like to complain about that uh commercial cloud revenue that's the more enterprise stuff and that they that's the sixth consecutive quarter that they doubled revenue which is very impressive and I wouldn't be you know I wouldn't cry for them if suddenly that growth rate slows down because law of large numbers that's a little bit difficult to maintain that's at 5.5 billion and that's up 1.1 billion over just two quarters so that's like you can see that percentage growth rate so total crowd revenue cloud revenue is 7 billion the other two interesting parts of the business I want to talk about is Bing Advertising growing by 23% and U.S. market share up to approximately 20 This is interesting. I think we'll see when Google does the results and they haven't yet. I think Google has been t- feeling some pressure, one, with the recent Firefox Yahoo deal, which means that everyone who turns on Firefox has Yahoo, which is powered by Bing, just as an aside. And we have all of these services that Microsoft doesn't really want or th- they would like you to, but they're not that concerned about you going on Bing.com. So if you're using Siri, you're feeding information to Bing, it's feeding it back. Or at least in some instances, if you're using Cortana, you got Bing coming back. And now they're integrating the search into the desktop. And I think that this is actually a pretty important uh, arena to discuss. I don't know how much we'll get into it today because this is mostly about the earnings. But anything you wanted to say about that? I actually didn't know that Yahoo was powered by Bing, so you learn something new every day. That's why I'm here, Nick. <laughs> I guess I got to keep you around. Yeah. Windows, not so well. And I mentioned this before, the XP effect ended. Everyone was sitting on XP computers. It was 
totally it's disgusting how you can have like such an old operating system on your PC so vulnerable on very w uh, hardly maintained by patches and then they finally stopped doing it and people are like oh maybe I should update my computer it's like how, what were you working on how could you survive because if you had an XP computer it must have been so slow but regardless that looks like it those the effect of people kind of mass migrating to 7 or 8 has ended so it's back to normal so we saw pro com you know commercial and non pro more uh, consumer revenue fall by 13%. Volume licensing, so instead of, that's kind of, I'm a little, I'm not a financial analyst, but I'm assuming these are large blocks of computers, so that's corporate again, buying increasing, which is all that we saw last year, kind of corporations getting more stronger, being able to more invest in IT and things like that. I think an interesting thing is Nadella said that how he would monetize Windows going forward is pointing at services revenue and the sales on the Windows Store, Bing, and Xbox Live. And I think you can see that because like they're doing a lot of like uh, again offers to get people to use Windows. So that free upgrade from seven, eight to ten, which is going to be valid for one year after ten launches, uh, they're kind of thinking they'll supplement or even grow their revenue if they can build a big enough base. Kind of start to do it the Apple or Google way, where they can start making revenue on developers' apps, a percentage, and on Xbox, you know, music sales. So that'll be interesting. And a nice note is that in just the few days after the ten event, the amount of testers went from 1.7 million to 2 million. So we got 2 million people testing Windows 10 because they want to which is very encouraging. Uh, summary, the weakness in the stock that was seen in the last few days was because of the guidance and that looks like Microsoft was reporting only they only expect to see four to five percent revenue growth over the next few quarters. Where that's coming from is Forex issues so the dollar strengthening as a US corporation Microsoft is highly affected by that given if they sell things you know, overseas and weak foreign demand. The Japanese market, which is very, uh, you know, there's lots of corporations there, so they are proportionally affected if some kind of market like that, which has a lot of corporates, customers, is affected by some kind of economic downturn. So it's a, it's interesting to see how Microsoft pushes forward. I wanted to note about the hardware and the revenue falling. I think the strategy is to not to push at like basement prices they're still charging and making profits on a lot of these uh, devices like Xbox but they want to get those numbers up in terms of install base in all cases specifically on Lumia and Xbox because it lets them once again sell on Xbox more games more movies you know get people to subscribe to uh, video services and then on the Lumia obviously to get people to start to use or start to think about services like Bing OneDrive just to get you know it's kind of like building that base so I'm assuming that they're going to try to build on that base going forward so that's Microsoft in a nutshell now we'll move on to Apple's earnings report and for that Nick will inform us Nick what did you see and what did you want to talk about well as a disclaimer uh, I think the both of us are shareholders in Apple as I mentioned in the previous clash cast so it's good news it's good news for us it's good news for everybody yeah one note <laughs> once again uh, I'm a Microsoft investor. I don't think I am, n n I am not. <laughs> okay, so that should uh, help a little bit. Go but ahead. I thought about it. Anyways, so uh, tremendous numbers from Apple. Truly a record-breaking quarter. Um, I mentioned this in the last Clash Cast that we could see some impressive numbers, and we have. So I'm just going to start off with some overall figures. Uh, Apple's net income for the quarter was 18 billion dollars, which tremendous figures. It was up 37 percent year over year. And this quarter was considered the most profit ever earned by any company in one quarter in history. So truly record-breaking numbers. To put that into perspective, I got a little fun fact here because I know the audience loves fun facts. Uh, that's $8.3 million in profit per hour, 24 hours a day. That's more than you earn in your life times four. Pretty or much. Or five times. Like, just, yeah. Pretty put... much. Well, I don't know. Yeah, we'll Who knows? see. <laughs> So their earnings per share was $3.06, that's up 48%, and just uh, to show what the expectations were, it's 2.6 uh, was the expected earnings per share, so quite a quite an uptick there. Um, right now, uh, Apple stock is trading up over 6% in after-hour trading. Uh, they ended the quarter with $178 billion in cash. Despite all of their buybacks, 
um, and all of their investments throughout the quarter, they still have $178 billion in cash. So truly incredible numbers. Uh, and looking forward, they provided strong guidance for the March quarter, although they're going to face the, uh, stra- the same foreign exchange uh, headwinds that Microsoft and everyone else in the world is facing as the ruble weakens and the dollar strengthens. And so strong guidance. And, and to quote uh, Luca, who is their financial, I think he's the CFO, he's very, very confident in the pipeline of product and services to take us through um, for the March quarter. Don't they always say that, though? Like, even, like, when they were kind of not doing too well, I remember, like, they're always very confident in the... <laughs> you know, it's nothing... I don't know. Yeah, I guess. It's always good to be confident, isn't it? Yeah, but aren't you, like... But he said two varies this time. Did he say two varies in the past? I don't think so. So I think that that helps. Or he's just being very emphatic to be... Right. Yeah. All right, so let's start with Apple Pay. Um, Tim Cook has labeled 2015 the year of Apple Pay. I don't know what you guys had planned, um, but this is the year of Apple Pay, so watch out for that. Um, (laughs) As of now, uh, 750 banks and credit unions have signed up, um, and three months after the launch, Apple Pay makes $2 out of every $3 for digital payments. Um, And some locations specifically are a little bit higher than that. Panera says that 80% of their contactless payments are made through Apple Pay. Um, One of the questions that they got in the Q&A session was what they see as the future of Apple Pay and and will it develop not only through different banks in different countries and geographically develop, um, but the technology uh, and the features behind it. And one of the things that the person who asked the question asked was, would they ever delve into... um, C to C, so consumer to consumer um, services through Apple Pay. So something like uh, a Venmo, um, where you know me and you, well, not you because you don't have an iPhone, Marson. I can use it. (laughs) Me and another iPhone user um, would exchange money through Apple Pay. So I think that's uh, very interesting. And Tim Cook specifically said that there's tons of things on their roadmap and tons of countries. So there's definitely some innovation down the line that we could see with Apple Pay. Okay, my. Uh, well, that's it's nothing. It's not even something that people expected like a year ago. No one thought that they'd have this new product or this line of revenue. My only question, or at least give a uh, look into your crystal ball. Where do you see these these innovations that they're talking about? What what do you think? Is it just going to be that Venmo thing, or are you thinking something more fancy? Ah, put me on the spot there for <laughs> becoming a technological innovator at Apple. <laughs> Uh, I think C2C is definitely the way to go. I I don't really, you know, it's designed to be pretty swift now. So you just tap your thing, you have your fingerprint, it vibrates, uh, you get notifications. I have my American Express card there. And no matter if I'm using Apple Pay or or just my credit card, it gives me a pop-up notification that there was a charge. Um, So to me, it feels like a a pretty complete solution. So it's, it's interesting to see what they have I guess I'm not being too creative tonight. But, I, uh, yeah, I understand. I just think you're right because how much easier could you get without being secure? I mean, like, <laughs> what, press a right. button? Like, that's the easiest <laughs> thing, but, like, anyone can press the button. Right, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope that, you know, it'll continue to adopt in adapt in, you know, geography so other countries can use it so those numbers increase as well as more stores. I mean, I think... Truly, what what it comes down to is the availability of stores. I mean, I have Apple Pay, clearly, um, and I haven't really used it that often, sad to say. Um, I have used it every time I've went to Panera, but overall, um, you know, it's sort of that awkward situation when you go to pay. You don't want to just tap your phone to the machine and then, God forbid, they don't accept Apple Pay. Oh, no, no. And the cashier looks at you like you're the most craziest person you've ever seen. Um, I think... What I will say is that it's uh, it's one of those few instances where an Apple product is benefiting the competition or at least everyone else because it's pushing the NFC readers. So whatever contactless payment, payment systems you have on your Google or Windows Phone device are more likely to be accepted because of Apple Pay and all these systems kind of popping up together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to move on to iPhone, which is, you know, Apple's now bread and butter. It's, you know, weird to think that over seven years ago, the iPhone didn't exist for Apple. 
Um, but now it exists, and it's now, after this quarter, making up 69% of their revenue. It basically um, is Apple at this point, right? Right, which is which is a record for Apple. So 69% of Apple's revenue comes from iPhone. Um, so anyway, some of the numbers, 74.4 uh, million iPhones sold. That's up 46% year over year, and it's their biggest quarter ever, and it beat their biggest quarter ever by 23 million units. Uh, the estimate was that they'd sell 65 million. So truly, the iPhone 6 um, is is you know sparking this growth. Why this this specific generation? What was the what was the driver in your? I I don't know. It's it's hard to say why why this specific quarter has has blown up so especially. I mean, I guess you have to think that you know people really wanted a bigger phone, considering that's that's the biggest change. Um, it probably is the biggest innovation to iPhone, um, you know, since the early years. Um, I'd say before iPhone four, jumping to iPhone four was definitely huge. Um, but four to five, five to five S, all of those were, you know, nothing major. Um, I think this this iPhone six has brought them into different categories, and it answered a lot of the the problems uh, specifically Android users had around screen size. Mm-hmm. I think that I would totally agree. I think that that was just it, really, honestly. Just all of these people who just got the Note and and these larger smartphones, they had right. the Apple option now. Because I, you know, it was kind of jokingly before the big phones, but I remember people saying, oh, I got this because it had a bigger screen, I can't handle the thing. I think that that's just what it is, which is... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, about a year ago, uh, Abrun was saying Apple was doomed with the iPhone and they got to either come up with, you know, a cheap phone um, or, you know, a bigger screen phone or maybe a, a combination of both. They came out with the 5C. People didn't think that was cheap enough, but I don't really think that that was Apple's shot at a cheap phone. Um, but the iPhone 6 is definitely, you know, it's proved to the world that you can make, you know, high-end devices and, and maintain growth um, and customer base and, and grow tremendously just through the high end. Uh, so just some more numbers, 97% customer satisfaction rate for the iPhone, um, and the iPhone counts for 53% of mobile web traffic. Um, that's worldwide, and that's double uh, its closest competitor. Um, Apple also this quarter has sold their one billionth iOS device. I, I heard they kept it. <laughs> they did. They, <laughs> they they took it back home, uh, and and it's supposedly Tim said it was kept in Apple headquarters. How could they count it? So like, how do they know that that's the billions? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Tim's an operations guy, so if you think maybe. that first since the first one, they've been like waiting, like maybe they have a s- big countdown clock on Tim's desk. <laughs> oh, here it comes to get people down there right now. Make sure you catch it before it gets into on the store shelves. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But uh, people were so in the Q and A. People were probing them to figure out more of what the mix was: how many six pluses, how many sixes versus five s's and fives. Tim, you know, was very hesitant on that. I don't know why particularly, um, but he said that they don't report out the iPhone mix, but the six is by far the strongest. He did say that there's a clear geographic preference. He didn't name any specifics, but he said that there's some regions that are much higher on the six plus than the six. So I guess then you know in different countries the phablet has taken off more um, than it definitely has in the U.S. and I don't know about other countries. Uh, so based on on you know future questions that were asked in the in the Q and A session, um, they wanted to probe more about you know who's buying these iPhones. So he didn't reveal much, but uh, Tim said that it is their highest quarter for new customers, um, and also their highest Android switcher rate. Um, from all previous three launches. He said, I don't know, it was very weird because he said, we didn't look at the data before three pre-launches, so it could have it gone back before that. But we know with the data that we have that it was highest <laughs> Android switcher rate for the three previous launches. Yeah, that's bizarre. I don't understand that. I'm sure they were tracking that for, since the beginning. Um, finally, as they have reason to be, Tim said that they're incredibly bullish on the iPhone going forward. He says it's the best smartphone in the world. Customers are telling us that. And the market is telling us that. And with 74.4 million iPhones sold with 46% growth, you know, it's hard to argue with Tim there. Okay, here's my question to you. Where do you see this thing going? What's the next step? Can they maintain this? 
Uh, well, Tim said that there's a, a lot of people that still haven't upgraded. He said that um, coming from a previous iPhone to a new iPhone, that number of total sales is only in the low teens. So obviously, you know, phones are driven by uh, that upgrade cycle, especially in, in you know, regions where the, the carriers subsidize the phones. So there's going to be people upgrading their phones throughout the quarter, uh, throughout the rest of the year. I know my brother just upgraded his phone, even though I was yelling at him. Um, when the phone first came out, because he was on a 4S. Uh, I was yelling at him to upgrade, and he hasn't until now, because he went to New Orleans and smashed his 4S. He just uh, so. hated it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, But obviously, people are going to continue to upgrade. It's still a great product line. Um, I don't know what Samsung's planning on coming out or what end of the competition is, but iPhone 6 and 6 Plus is a solid product, and, and it'll definitely take them through... Um, to the next launch, which probably would be sometime in September or October. And only the rumors that I've heard about that phone were uh, it's supposedly going to be the biggest camera upgrade that the iPhone's ever seen. Interesting. Uh, Those are the only rumors out there that I've heard um, that have any merit so far. I would hope they would make it flush with the surface because that that really, like, that, that little sticking thing, that little camera thing that sticks out, it's a little annoying for me. Like that, like the way it does it. I know that mine does that too, but it's like a, a design feature. Like it, it doesn't feel out of place. Like it's very strange for me how it's like this little thing off in the corner that's just. Yeah, it's it's definitely strange, and you know, I, I'm sure there was plenty of discussions at Johnny Ives' table for that. Um, I don't know how it eventually wound up like this. If they really couldn't make it smaller, um, or they're gonna make it smaller in the iPhone six. And they a success, and they could have made it smaller in the iPhone six, but it's just another thing that they can say they improved on. <laughs> I'll put you on. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Then, do you think that's going to be one of the things they'll talk about, or sh- or is that going to be like a thing that they're going to do with this new model? If it's the biggest advancement in camera uh, for iPhone, it may not get any thinner, depending on how you know um, vastly they improve upon it. One of the things that I heard was optical zoom, um, which I think is in very, very few smartphones. Everything is now digital zoom. So optical zoom will definitely take it to the next level, um, which is, you know, I don't have to get into the specifics being a photographer, but it is a giant leap forward. Right. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if, if all of these technology advancements that they're going to make, if it does become the biggest camera improvement for the iPhone, um, I don't know if they'll be able to make it any thinner. I would definitely agree that the iPhone is usually the second best camera, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those Lumiers, that's all they're good for. Anyways, I'm going to quickly run through the Mac numbers. Nothing too surprising there. Um, App Store revenue and Mac revenue were both up, and they had quarterly records for revenue. Um, And the Mac, uh, as Tim loves to point out, the Mac sales were up despite a PC market decline. And out of the last 35 quarters, Mac has seen a gain in market share, 34 of the last 35. When, when is it going to have that straight run? Why is it still that? I don't know. <laughs> why? I, don't know. <laughs> why? I don't know when that one month came. And, and why don't they say 34 out of 36? You know, maybe they can go 35 out of 37. But they like saying 34 out of 35. Right. It's always gonna You be... think if it was the last 20 quarters that they'd just be able to say 20 out of the last 20 quarters. But I'm guessing that one quarter has fallen closer to now than in the past yeah so it would just be like four straight quarters which is not nearly as cool um i think one note about this why do i keep saying that one note i just it's just the fastest way for me to say a, a, a comment a comment that i have on this is the pc market decline i think that's not too accurate because we have different reports from different anal- analyst agencies some that say the market has stabilized and grew slightly and one that said it only declined slightly so that's just my only beef with what tim said are you are you doubting tim <laughs> no i'm just saying but i gotta i gotta fact check here and maybe he <laughs> doesn't know maybe he he has to pick a, a you know a right, so it's like the state of the union and you're you're fact checking me and tim cook hey it's good it's good it keeps us honest okay let's do the ipad my favorite part <laughs> yeah you would like this part so ipad Units, uh, 21.4 million sold, 22 million were expected (gasps) by the analysts, and we're down 17%. Uh, iPad revenue, I mean, we're still talking about 21 million units. How many services were sold? Right, but how many of those iPads are used (laughs) for more than Angry Birds? $9 billion in revenue, that's nothing to sneeze at. 98%, all right, so (laughs) here's Apple's thing, and I'm sure it's everybody's thing, but when they can't, 
when they can't announce great numbers, they talk about a bunch of other weird statistics <laughs> that make it sound really good. So, so they, they blow past the numbers really quickly, and then they start talking about all of these weird facts. So I have a couple of them for you. 98% customer satisfaction rate for the iPad Air. 60% of people who are in the market to buy a tablet in the next 90 days, 60% of them say that they plan to purchase an iPad. Why does it feel like it's not that impressive? I, I six and ten, three and five people want to buy an iPad. I would, their next tablet. I would say it used to be ten and ten, right? Or no. nine and ten. Well, yeah. Well, when it was first out, and there was no competition. I, and, you uh, know, since the Surface came out. Yeah. Uh, that's Anyways, yeah. Okay. <laughs> iPad accounts. See, this is one of those weird facts. iPad accounts for eighty-two percent of e-commerce transactions from tablets. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it's an impressive figure if you think yeah. about all the, the e-commerce done on tablets. But you know, I think it's one of those puff uh, statistics to make the iPad not look so bad. It's those things um, that you already know, like, obviously, I just see <laughs> them, like, in, like, all, like, they were the first tablet, they were the most polished tablet, and they were easy to buy in bulk, so lots of restaurants just have them set up and things like that. <laughs> right? You're just shooting down all of these facts. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> so, uh, iPad, the first time people have bought an iPad is they're brand new to iPad, 50% of the people that bought an iPad were, were new to iPad, and in China, it's going to be higher. It's 70% in China. Um, yeah, it speaks to sort of the upgrade cycle. Someone asked him about, you know, how does the upgrade cycle compare, and is that why we're losing out? Um, and he said that the iPad up upgrade cycle is obviously longer than the iPhone. He said that they haven't been in the business too long to say that with certainty. But I mean, people upgrade their iPhones when they come upgrade eligible every two years. Um, iPad, you know, I don't think people are upgrading every three or four years. He put it somewhere in between, you know, a Mac and an iPhone in terms of upgrade time. And I think that's spite on. And that means everybody that you've previously sold an iPad to hopefully should upgrade not everyone's going to go upgrade to an ipad but you know there's still going to be a lot of people upgrading the china numbers are impressive i, I heard the overall china numbers i don't think we're going to go over that but i i heard that those numbers are growing i think as the middle class there gets more access to the apple products and i heard they know open new stores too Right, yeah. Uh, one of the things that Tim says about that 50% buyer rate is that when you look at all those first-time buyer rates, he believes that there's not a saturated market in iPad, which is what some people you know, have, have critiqued the iPad for, that everyone already has it, there's no need for them to upgrade, so that's probably why, but if 50% of them are buying it for the first time, mm -hmm. um, it, it proves to Tim, at least, that it's not a saturated market. And their usage, iPad usage, I think this is done by overall web traffic and they didn't really explain it but it's six times the nearest competition of people actually using their tablet i don't think they're comparing it to the surface because they probably consider that as a hybrid device so we're, yeah we're, that's probably in a different category all right we're thinking about uh the crappy android tablets here which i would not you know disagree with right so uh multiple times on the call he uh tim has used this expression that in the long arc of time that's how he how he expressed it multiple times on the call. Over the long arc of time, the iPad is a great business, and he feels very and again two varies very very good about what's in the pipeline for iPad, and a very very bright future. So I think I think they sat down and they said if we ever say the word very, we got to say it twice. It's like um, deliberate, because that's what they've seen. Um, and he said to analysts, and I think this is the you know calm them down a bit. He said. Compared quarter to quarter, we're not going to see that much growth. But again, over that long arc of time, he thinks that iPad is still a great business. And the last bit of information I have today is about the Apple Watch. Um, this is news coming from Tim Cook himself. Uh, all along, Apple has said that the Apple Watch will come out in early 2015. And we've had those crazy analysts and rumor people say, oh, it's going to come out in February. It's going to come out in March. Everyone was saying March um, most recently. But Apple and Tim Cook have announced that the Apple Watch will ship in April. And according to Tim, that's on target. Of course, he got a question later on. He's like, oh, I thought it was going to come out in March, but you're saying April. Is there any reason why you're behind schedule? And Tim said that uh, they're on target. And I think this is an interesting piece of information because Apple always likes to say, I think they did this with the Mac Pro um, and the new iMacs that came out. They always say like early 2015, you know, something like that. So Tim actually defined it for everybody today. Hmm. Uh, he said that early 
in the year for them is the first four months, mid is the next four months, and end is the last four months. Was that smart to say? Because he's kind of like painting himself into a corner here. The next time they do that and they slip by like two weeks. <laughs> I think he will, but I, I guess, you know, now that he's defined it, now that it's law for Apple, I think they're going to have to find, uh, follow this this regiment because April will put it into the fourth month, which is, you know, I think fairly late into the year, but it's Apple will still, early. Apple still consider that early 2015. So that's all I have for Apple earnings overall. Um, it was a very record-breaking, very unbelievably impressive quarter. Um, and, you know, iPad is the only thing that's lacking. So let's, and we got that one piece of news about the Apple Watch. So let's just zero in on the iPad for a second. Where do you see them taking the iPad, and why do you think they would do that? Uh, you know, they mentioned some cannibalism uh, from the Mac line and from the iPhones getting bigger. That's Apple that mentioned that cannibalism, and I have to agree with them. I think, you know, as much as they say... As much as they have all of those commercials that push all of the different use cases for iPad and show how people are using it to do crazy things, and I'm sure they're out there, I guess the the iOS really needs to to be beefed up on an iPad, and there needs to be some additional functionality that's different from iOS on an iPhone, and and that could be you know the multitasking that's been long. This rumored. sounds familiar. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying merge it with OS X like Windows did. Um, although I'm not critiquing Windows because they do have that tablet mode and desktop mode. <laughs> and yes, it is working. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think they need to do something to beef it up. Obviously, there's iPad Pro rumors out there. Um, Pro, as Markson has pointed out to me earlier, could be mean different things. Everyone's thinking that it's going to be 12 inches, which is actually interesting because supposedly they're rumored their new MacBook Air is going to be 12 inches. So that would put the devices at the same screen size which would make it a little bit different um, for the consumer. But what I've heard, um, which I thought was an interesting point, is that the iPhone, you can get the 5S, which is the smaller screen size. You can get the 6, which is the mid screen size. You can get the 6 Plus, which is the large screen size. If they come out with a larger screen iPad, you'd still have that small, medium, large, the small being the mini, the, the regular being the iPad Air, and then the large being the iPad Pro, um, which is interesting it's definitely a post Steve Jobs thing. Steve Jobs, you know, one size fits all. This is what you need. I don't care what you think. Right. Um, Tim is definitely giving customers a lot, a lot more of a choice. You kind of have like this, uh, this melting. Like when you go from one product line, you get to the highest one, and it like melts into the next one. Like it's kind of interesting. It keeps like melting into like the next iPhone goes to iPad and iPad goes to MacBook. Yeah, so I think, you know, he also mentioned IBM and their enterprises and how how that's going to grow the iPad business, but I think really it's it's got to present something strong for me to to go to my iPad. I don't know about that IBM thing too cuz IBM themselves are not doing very well these days. I don't know if they're very good at what they do anymore, but that's a different topic. <laughs> you heard it here first, Marson <laughs> predicting the collapse of IBM. Well, they had a, a, a you don't you don't probably don't track them, but they have had horrific quarters the last few. It's been a bloodbath over there, like very bad. The only thing that else that I want to add out, um, just for me being an Apple fanboy for pretty much my whole life, and it's a little bit sad as Apple moves on, but I think this is the second quarter or so where they stopped talking about the iPod, which, you know, is a, a love device by many people. Apple fans and non-Apple fans love the iPod, and they stopped talking about those numbers, so it's kind of see, it's kind of sad to see that fade away. You have one. It's called the iPhone 6. That's basically <laughs> what it is, the spiritual, pr- pr- uh, sp- spiritual successor. All right, Marson, that's all I have for you today. That was quite a lot, and uh, I learned a lot. As did I. Who knew that Bing powers Yahoo Search? All right, so that's this week's episode of The Clash Cast. We hope that you join us for the next one, which is a topic to be determined. We're hoping to get some guests on um, to have a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is brand new out there uh if you don't already follow us on twitter you can follow us on twitter we also have a facebook page friend us on facebook or like our page i believe it is um and as always visit clashtech.com like it's something that you need to do every day because we love to provide you guys with information so thanks for listening to us this day 
Marcin, do you have anything else to say? We have uh, more besides the Clash cast. I hope that we can launch that soon. Uh, it might target a little bit of a different audience, but I'm sure we'll have some crossover, so look for that too. That, that's all I really wanted to say. Who Marcin's being a, a sketchy Tim Cook and dropping a hint for a future product. I'm very, very excited about this project. <laughs> oh, well, he's too very. <laughs> that's official. Do you think early, mid, or late 2050? <laughs> I won't commit. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Marcin. <laughs> <laughs>